great uh, info. We're not going to make up anything today. As always, uh, we are joined by Andrew Combo. So I'll have to discuss the latest in the NBA, the NCAA, and anything else that you guys want to talk about in the comments. So uh, don't forget to hit us up there. And if you want to get your question answered directly with a uh, lot of hype and a lot of love and to put on the screen, then the Super Chat is the way to do that uh, on the YouTube side. Welcome, everybody here. Welcome, Combo. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a minute. What's going on, my man? All is well. Did you get a little di digital detox action going on? What, what was up with you, man? You've been I all tried. over the you've been, you've been all over the country. I was I was all over the country. I was in San Francisco. I was in um, where else was I? Vegas. I was in Tampa for a minute. I was in Charleston, South Carolina, and then Savannah, Georgia, with a little strip into to Beaufort, uh, South Carolina, in between. Uh, a really great taste of the South uh, in more ways than one. Certainly, the food was incredible uh, across the board there. And uh, just a recharging of the batteries, spring break, if you will. And um, and man, uh, after an 18-hour trek to get back home yesterday yeah. with the planes, uh, I'm, uh, I'm I'm ready to go. Yeah, how was Vegas? Did it look like the Hangover, or was it a little bit different for you? Oh, it was it was different. It was actually a pod jam, a bunch of. of oh, that's uh, right. You told me about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was my it was my political podcast. I, we performed it uh, in front of a, a really nice group of people, uh, and then there was comedians. There was music. It was a really cool event. I, I can imagine that you know five years from now we're going to look back on the quaint version of the first one we did as it continues to grow. So um, it was great. And then I uh, got a chance to go see the Warriors against the Grizzlies uh, last week. Ooh. And um, uh, what else did I do? And then I was uh, yeah, just, just traveling. It was, uh, it was a really nice time. Did you go anywhere for spring break? I did not, man. Just working on shows, working on combos court, you know. I'm just I'm in, the man. I'm in you, the trenches. I don't take days off, Coach Nick. I, don't I know, take days I know, off. I know. Well, you know, I got to get the comments going. But, up. you know, during May, I probably will uh, step out to somewhere warmer even though New York will probably be pretty warm. But I think, you know, I might keep the things rolling schedule-wise, you know, just have maybe pods coming out while I'm here, you know, just even though I might not actually have to press that button while I'm on vacation, you know. But I, I have faith that you'll figure that out. And, um, and man, yeah, you just uh, – you keep that grinding. So, yeah. uh, let's I, – I suppose let's talk about Wendy for a minute here because oh, that's yeah. the title of the show. Um, we need to figure out exactly where he fits – um, you know, the, the title of best rookie ever is a tough one because there have been quite a few. And in the past, they've been 21 or 22 years old coming into the league, having not been allowed to enter earlier than that. So that's a big uh, obstacle, I suppose, for women. Yeah. Women, yeah, argument for best rookie ever, because, again, we're limiting it to what he's done in this season. Um, right. what, what do you think so far? I mean, he's definitely up there. The thing with him that probably over any other rookie I've ever seen is that it's kind of hard to figure out what his ceiling really is. Like, the ceiling is just weird. Like, it might be some, you know how, like, AI, we really don't know what's going to come about when it comes to AI? Like, mm -hmm. we don't know where it'll be in five years. I feel like it's the same with Wemby. Interesting. And by the way, I had a thought about AI on my trip. Um, why can't we just use AI to, to invest in the stock market? How come AI wouldn't be like the best, um, you know, uh, advisor of that? It has <laughs> access to every ma imaginable uh, version of in uh, information. Uh, I'm going to look into that. If anybody knows about that, is doing it. I think there's a couple places out there that do it, but uh, I don't know. Let me know because I think AI is ultimately going to be a lot very helpful for a lot of these things, probably fantasy sports and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but the here's my take on it. There, there have obviously, I, I think, obviously been better rookie of the year performances by other players. I think I'm, you know, trying to think off the top of my head. I mean, like the numbers would back up, like Michael Jordan's rookie year was better numbers wise mm, and also right. probably polish wise. Um, so when you think that we can't know necessarily what his future is going to be, what I think I'm taking from this rookie year is he is displaying what it will be. We, we do know what his ceiling is. And it is as high as anyone's ceiling has ever been. So while this rookie year is still filled with plenty of rookie issues that we see, footwork, balance, strength, um, decision-making, yada, yada, um, when, when we do get the evidence that we're looking for in terms of uh, skill level all around and with the size, that is really what makes me excited about this. And I think that this is where you know what he is laying out now, and we know that there will be progression and there will be improvement, um, means to me that this the, really the question is will he be the greatest of all time 
Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think it's a fair question when we're watching what he could do. And then imagine him just adding just a little bit of strength, what that would do. Yeah. I mean, that oh, yeah. that's when it gets really scary for the rest of the league. And we'll have to touch upon that with a little bit with the, the ED thing going on in Purdue uh, in the tournament right now. But um, yes, I mean, there, there are plenty of instances where Wambanyama, and by the way, it's not necessarily a strength thing. It's also leverage because he is so tall that guys can get kind of lower than him and knock him off his position. Uh, and But he he can recover pretty well. He is very dexterous. He's very balanced. He's very uh, long. Yeah. He can he can finish awkwardly. You know, that's another one of those things that we don't talk about a lot is he can actually get up in the air and be like sort of push off of his center of gravity, but still finish. Um, but, you know, th there's some interesting things that, you know, again, the kid is what, 19? Yeah. Um, 19. You know, there's the foot plants when he's coming around some of his, of, of his uh, post ups. Um, I was a little bit wondering like, like what, the, what pop would do with him in their offense as far as, I mean, you know, we, we know that pop is pretty um, progressive in terms of positioning in a way that they weren't going to just throw him down to the low block every single time. Um, and they're letting him shoot threes off the, off the dribble, you know, which is great to see. Right. Um, you know, but there's, there, you know, and there's just a progression there that I know generally we'll see better, but like, but let's get back to like even other uh, rookie of the year campaigns, like Luca coming in mm -hmm. and kind of a similar thing was, was had a better rookie year. I think he was better, more polished, more. Yeah. Solid. I mean, better player. And you know, I've always been high on Lucas, Lucas since the draft. And it's interesting. He just started screaming at Sacramento front office members that you should have drafted me in the middle of the game, which is totally true. I was saying that back then, but Wemby's ceiling is even higher than Lucas, which is, Pretty crazy to say. Uh, yes, and, and primarily because of the height, right? Like the, what yeah. he can do at that height makes it unfair. And by the way, Luca's height really helps him too. 100%. His setbacks, if there's anybody who's his height or, or shorter than him, you know, the defense is not really going to affect much of that. Well, throw it onto a seven foot four guy doing these things, and it really doesn't affect anybody. It, it almost doesn't matter if there's defense out there. The only thing time that matters for him is when he's down low around the basket, where guys can actually use some more of that physical strength. Um, but even still, and, and you know, the one thing I think I, I, the biggest red, not red flag, but the biggest hole in his game right now for Wembenyama to me would be his offensive rebounding. I feel like um, he just ends up floating around a little bit in the perimeter more than he should. Um, and should have a, a higher offensive rebounding percentage because of his just natural, uh, you know, advantage down there. Yeah, you mentioned you thought about how Pop would implement him into the offense. My thing, going back to the summer, is I always said I wanted him to take a press Maravich approach, where just let Wemby be, like let him be creative and let's see what we got here. And I think Pop has he's been doing more of that because we even see some point Wemby, him initiating more offense, him having the basketball. And then as a lob threat, I mean, probably one of the best lob threats in the lob threats in the NBA. That's why I'd love I'd love to see him paired with um, Trey Young. I think that'd be really fun. Right, and because the key is, it's it ain't easy to throw a lob a combo. You could you could uh, you could agree with that one. I think right. Well, I, I was me personally, I was always pretty good at that, Coach Nick. Okay, good. Yeah. but it's not easy. And like, because by the way, if it were easier, then they throw lobs on every possession, right? But well, we for him, it should be easy, right? It is. You don't have to be very accurate. I'll tell you that. You just kind of get it somewhere in the area. I mean, so some people were talking about. Um, I heard people saying that like the Trey Wemby pairing wouldn't be great because Trey might not even throw the ball. Like he he's going to want to be the main guy. But when you're the type of passer Trey is, I don't even think you could have that type of target and not throw it instinctively. You know? Yeah. It'd just be too easy. Right. And by the way, what makes Trey really great at throwing the lob is his floater. So he yes. he's a nice balance where you really keep people, uh, you know, uh, guessing as to what they're going to do. Very, very hard. That would be an amazing uh, combo for sure. Uh, we'll have to get into the 2018 NBA draft in a second because I like that that storyline that Luca brought up uh, in an angry way, I suppose, at the end of the Kings game. Uh, but first, we have our first Super Chat. And don't forget, if you want your questions answered, that's the best way to do it. Love the, the conversation going already in the comments. Uh, and we have our first one from Friend of the Breakdown, Alan Tran. Thank you so much, Alan. Very, very generous of you. Really helps to keep this show going. Um, and Alan says, I think the key to Wemby becoming unstoppable is either developing a dominant low post footwork game like Elijah Wan and or a creation game, Jokic. And by the way, he has both of those things. Now, if you watch enough footage, you're going to see the kind of passing that is like Jokic. But there ain't finishing a lot of those in with the Spurs right now, or he's throwing them away. He's still learning exactly, but he's throwing behind the head, you know, off the dribble passes as he's driving into the lane and the guys aren't quite ready, or or the defense figures it out and knocks it away. 
But like, there's a willingness there that I think might be his best attribute of all. Of all. Yeah, I mean, he sees the floor great. I mean, it's not at a Jokic level, and obviously the post work isn't like at a Lajuan level, but the skill level is really high. Like, he can finish with either hand. Ooh. He's been shooting it a lot better from three. He has a little mid-range in his game when he needs it. I mean, he really has it all in terms of skill, and then you add on that he's seven foot five and athletic and could stay on balance at that size. You put all of that together, and it's just a ridiculous mix. Yeah, and he's quick. He, he has yeah, a lot of yeah. quickness in there, so he can face you up and get by you. And you know he doesn't have to get by you. He just needs to kind of get sideways to you, and then he can elevate and drop it on your head. Mm-hmm. Um, but here's what I've been thinking about recently watching Caitlin Clark play in the tournament. And again, if you haven't seen the video I did on her, mm-hmm. please go back and watch it because she's doing things in the women's game we have never seen before. And the key here is it, it's her passing. I know that she's broken the record for all-time scoring in the, in the NCAA, uh, men or women. But – it's because her passing is so good that you just don't know what she's going to do as she gets, you know, into her bag. And there's no question that that the the threat of the pass, which is what Luca has and Jokic does and, and Trey Young, all those guys, the threat of the pass makes them so much more of a uh, of a multidimensional threat that it, the defense really doesn't have much choice. Because are they going to pass? I got to be ready for that. Is he going to shoot it instead? Um, so that's what I'm seeing with Wembenyama. He's a willing passer. And I know we've talked about this before, but I, maybe we can really quickly have a discussion again. Is you know, a lot of times coaches will just shrug and say, "Oh, thank God we have that player who walked in the gym randomly and is a really willing passer. Wants to throw the crazy skip, you know, diagonal passes across the court." Um, Can we create that? Can you have a situation in a a culture, in an environment of a team where you don't just suddenly, you know, you don't just shrug and just are happy that, you know, the basketball gods blessed you with this player walking in the gym where you can create this? Mm. What do you think? I think passing is the most innate skill in basketball, but I also think you could work on it from a team aspect if you bake in ball handling drills and passing drills into the practice and into your culture. So I do think you could work on it. Like no dribble full court is a really cool way to work on your passing, right? Definitely work on your options of passing, just like you would work on your options in terms of being a finisher, right? Either hand, either foot. I know people don't like jump passes, but you could even work on that. I think you can bake it into your culture. I, I think what you described would get you the guys who could, they'll make the easy pass, you know, the one pass away mm-hmm. for the open jumper, that kind of thing. What I'm talking about, though, are the ones behind the head, you know, no look uh, to the corner for threes, the kind of stuff that Luka does or Jokic does. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I used to throw those all the time. And I, and I think we talked about this before, but the notion that uh, it's a personality thing where I think you have, um, you know, certain personalities that take pleasure out of setting another teammate up and you might have other personalities that don't get that same dopamine rush uh, of doing that they they get it only from shooting the basketball and scoring um and so that so if that is true then you're not going to change someone's personality and then if that's the case then you're never going to take certain players and make them into those kind of passers um even you know and then the other question then is is Jokic and and um, Doncic and player and Trey Young and guys like that who make those kind of crazy passes, um, you know, they're always looking to make those kind of passes. It feels like, right? So it's not like a switch you turn on and suddenly I'm that kind of guy, and then I'm going to be a scorer here, and then I'm going to be just a regular passer here. So again, if we're talking about global personality issues, which you don't just change, you can't. Ch- I can't change your personality, right? You're, that's what you're born with. Um, maybe we can't create that. But um, I'm fascinated by that notion because, again, it would be nice to be able to develop more passing like you described, just even the regular passing stuff. And, and, and you know, but but it would be even better if we could figure out how to train certain players to derive more pleasure out of throwing those passes and, and trying those. And by the way, it's also the environment of not being worried that you're going to get benched if you throw those passes. Yeah, it's basketball culture, right? At the end of the day, like almost how you grew up is a lot of it, too. Yeah, soccer probably has some of that built into oh, it. Yeah. Right? yeah, I mean, look, soccer culture overseas has so much influence on basketball. I realized quickly when I was playing overseas that, and you see Luca do this a lot, like when some player would get like a little injury, they'd start rolling on the floor and exaggerating it. Mm-hmm. It's it's very soccer-like over there, and uh, they're very yeah. influenced by soccer. And pa- passing is such a big part of soccer, so it all makes sense.
For sure. And and just to put a button on the Allen question or his comment would be, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think he's on his way to to having all the things he's describing in terms of the Elijah Wan yeah. footwork and the Jokic creation, uh, which is really, really a positive to see. The best part about his, his um, game right now for me, I think, would be grabbing the defensive rebound and then pushing the ball straight away. Uh, oh, yeah, and, then, yeah. and then he that's when he's getting into some of those really interesting passes to the no look stuff and the, the, the vision and, he has being so tall. And I, yeah, obviously, you could see over the defense, right? I mean, that that that'll be easy for him. Yeah. And, you know, we I think we, there used to be a general sense of, oh, you can't be that tall and dribbling down the court because, you know, the, the distance between your hand and the, and the floor is so great. That it's just going to get stolen. And guess what? It doesn't really get stolen that much. However, there are too many instances right now around the basket in his moves where the guys are coming over and they're knocking the ball away and causing some turnovers. Uh, and that's going to be one – one. I, I would like to see it cleaned up a little bit at least. And then, uh, But by the way, it doesn't need to get cleaned up that much if he graduates to 28, 29, 30 points a game, hitting those threes – getting those rebounds, then, you know, the three and a half, four turnovers a game is not as impactful. It's it's mitigated by the other stuff he's doing at a high rate. But we have some more Super Chats. Let's get to them. The Drew Show, best friend of the breakdown. Thank you so much, Drew Show. Great to see you. Great to have everyone back here for this huge show we have right now. How brain dead is the coach and GM of Wemby that they have this impactful of a defensive and offensive player and have this bad of a team? Well, do you want to break it to him, Combo? I mean – I don't think Coach Pop is brain dead, but shouts shout to the super chat, uh, the Drew right. Show. <laughs> well, I mean, I think you know what's what's in the background here is uh, the draft pick that they want this year, right? They want to be able mm. to maximize that draft pick. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I guess he doesn't like the idea of being in full tank mode while you have Wemby. Is is that the uh, is that the overall idea? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I feel like, are they winning a little bit more recently? Let me just check my. I feel like I've. Seen yeah, I mean, they've been better since All Star. They've been better since they. Went away from the Sohan point guard experiment, you know, which was yeah. kind of tough in the beginning. But um, yeah, I mean, no, I mean, they haven't been great. They're four and six in the last ten, and you know, but I mean, and, that's and, better than the beginning. They were right. terrible and, in the beginning. And they have a game and a half lead on Portland right now for the worst. I mean, they, they pulled out a they pulled out a tough win in the Garden. I mean, that's not easy. Um, yeah, the Knicks have been good. You know, they also realize that they really are they, between the the Wizards and the Pistons. I don't. It's too great of a, a challenge. They're not going to get underneath them. Um, and so I think that they're pretty much happy with where they are and their odds of getting with the, the, a pick that they want. Uh, I'm not even sure this draft is like an amazingly strong draft. I got to kind of start digging through that and, and as I'm trying to watch more of these games. Mm -hmm. um, but they clearly needed, you know, to, to maximize Wemby, it's great to have a, a better point guard that can throw those lobs. And they have Jones out there. They weren't playing him a lot in that role. But whenever you watch Wemby footage now, all I'm seeing is, you know, J Jones throwing these bobs and setting him up, which is really uh, going to be helpful for them. And if they get, a, you know, a couple more players, then, then they obviously can, can make a very quick ascendancy. So I would imagine that even by next year, you'll see the Spurs much closer to 500, if not higher. Yeah. I understand where the Drew show is coming from because he's saying, like, this guy is so great and – the team still isn't good, which is almost hard to do. So I, right. I see where he's coming for with it. Yeah, but yeah. but let's not let's not forget Wembenyama does have a lot of work to do as as well, and he's got a really good uh, skills coach. That, that's the scary part. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I mean, listen, the, the skills coach you can't you cannot uh, say anything but but uh, positive things about him because look at the skill, like the skills he already is displaying with his crossovers and his tweens, yeah. you know, and shooting off the dribble uh, from deep. I mean, it's all next level. Yeah, I mean, like every the skills trainer stuff, like I totally agree with you. I also think like so much of self development comes from self. Like Wemby's the type of guy that's going to seek out how do I get the footwork like Olajuwon? How do I get the passing like Jokic? Even if he doesn't get to the levels in those two departments, like he's very self aware and he's going to seek out that information. And yeah, like it's always great to have the best skills trainer and the best nutritionist, but it really just depends on if that individual wants to be great themselves. That that is obviously the, the biggest or the first thing you got to look at. So yeah. Drew Show is back again. Thank you so much, Drew. Almost every player on the Spurs has no defensive intensity. Yeah, yeah. And almost every player is a poor yeah, passer. Fair. Almost every player on the team cannot shoot. <laughs> well, it's we did fair. have a, a, a Vassell, um one-legged uh, three-pointer to the corner. Did you see that one a few games ago? No, that's tough, though. It was great, especially because it was really the only solution he had. He got kind of stuck, whatever, so he kind of went sideways off off the left foot to the left corner, beautiful, and it was just beautiful uh, for three. So um, 
I mean, yeah, it's, it is really, really tough because, again, I don't think that there's much incentive for them to win uh, at this point. But Or we can start whispering maybe Popovich isn't the greatest coach of all time, and maybe because he had uh, Parker and uh, Tim Duncan and, and Manu, uh, he looked a lot better than he maybe he was. And, you know, that maybe that could be the same for Phil Jackson and all those guys. That said, I think Pop and Phil would tell you that, you know, so much of, of what they got uh, and their success was <laughs> from having guys like Tim Duncan on their team. Yeah, I mean, how good a coach is is harder to quantify than how good a player is often, you know? Mm -hmm. Probably some of the best coaches in the world, you don't even know who they are, you know? Oh, because, absolutely. Uh, yeah, because, you know, they just never got the opportunity at the highest levels. Now, if you're if you're Wemby, right, you're going to play in the NBA and be a great player in the NBA. But if you, if you happen to be a Wemby-level coach, there's a chance that you might not ever coach in the NBA, like – you yeah, there's only 30 of those jobs. Listen, some of the finest coaches I've come into contact with are high school coaches. So yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, they're comfortable. They like their community. Like, they just want to be there. That's That fits who they are. You know, it, and it's just hard to quantify how much coaching matters in a lot of ways, even though, of course, it does matter so much. So some of the greatest coaches will never even know who they are. So it, it's always like a hard thing to quantify in general. Absolutely. And and I yeah. think, you know, if we're going to answer the question about Wemby, his rookie position, uh, you know, I don't he's not having the best rookie year of all time, uh, you know, and that's certainly clear by like even the use of the numbers. Um, and it's a little unfair because for so long you had 21 and 22 year old rookies. And so they're just by by virtue of being on the planet longer, uh, had more skill, more polish. But um, again, just to put a bow on that, I just feel like what he is, the, the evidence that he is uh, offering up to us indicates to me that his trajectory is higher than any any other player could could very well be ever um because of you know when you mix everything the skill level and the height um you know he could be the point guard ultimately yeah yeah I mean. uh oh we lost your we lost your audio what happened well <laughs> that's a new one we haven't had that happen to, to combo i don't know it started sounding are weird are we here you're back all right you're back yeah, we have, we have it like how you say what is time, what is positions anymore, right? Right. What is what are positions? Um, all right. Well, let's let's get on to the next. Um, and, and and so anyway, yes, uh, the Spurs are not an easy team to watch to, to finish up on on Drew's uh, uh, comment. And um, you know, I mean, there is promise. Vassell, we liked. Uh, you know, there are they have some 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 pieces there, but they clearly need to bring in some more NBA talent. Um, but I do feel like yes, as Wemby begins to progress too. Um, and they get another player or two, that, that ascendance will become, I think, could be very quick, uh, and they get right back into the name of the game. Um, but anyway, uh, again, if you have any other questions or comments, make sure that you can do it through the Super Chat on YouTube. That'll get you up on the screen. Uh, what else are we here to talk about? Are we going to talk about um, – oh, by the way, the other thing I, I had written in my notes I forgot to mention is – with um, Weminyama, the pick and pop is is just lethal. You know, you have a real terrible choice to make defensively how you want to deal with uh, him as a ball screener, and because he can roll and he'll pop yeah, and uh, he how, can hit those threes, it's tough. That's that's how him and Chet are similar. Both him and Chet are similar. Uh, him and KP are similar. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Um, a lot of those, uh, a lot of those things, and then it ultimately makes the pick and roll just you know uh, one of those I, you hope he misses. I mean, the pick and pop aspect of basketball is so translatable to the NBA level. I guess that's a good segue to like what Zach Eady will be in the NBA because that's not really a part of his game. Uh, absolutely. Eady is a throwback. It's a, a time machine, if you will, back in the days. Uh, he's, he is 7'3", I think they, they want to they, uh, put him at. Um, and we got let's 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 dissect this a little bit. I, hopefully people had a chance to watch him in the tournament in the last couple of games. Um, wh what do you think about him? What's your overall impression of, uh, of Eady? A very great college basketball player, obviously. I don't know how his skill set translates to the NBA level. And I said this before. I think you could be a top 450 player in the world and not necessarily fit in the NBA that well. And, uh, like, what – defensively, it might be tough, right, if, if you're trying to go switch. And offensively, like, what are you going to do? Just give a whole bunch of post touches to Zach Eady and kind of, like, throw the rest of the game plan – Right. In the trash? I mean, that, that when you're just like, what is post-entry anymore? Like, we don't even do that in the NBA anymore. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see. Well, it's funny because, you know, he had 40 points in the last yeah, game. Yeah, right? yeah. He I mean, he's, he's, a great, he's a great player. 
Yeah, and he went. Let me see what from the line. He um, he was forty point. He went thirteen for twenty one from the field, and then fourteen of twenty two from the free throw line. He could have had even more points, but there inside of those eight, um, let's see, eight misses he had. I think those are sort of might make some scouts squirm in their seats a little bit because. He struggles to some degree with uh, the physical you know, presence down there. Now, mm. that said, everyone's screaming about him being in the lane for three seconds or longer than three seconds. But don't forget, in, the, in college, if you get one foot out and the other foot off the, off the floor, then it starts over again, which is uh, unique to college rules for a three-point reset. Um, they want to complain that he's not getting called for any fouls. I'm going to probably take a, 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 a look at those a little bit more to see if there's anything else there. But he's pretty good about knowing when to contest and when not to. So he's not in foul trouble. Right. So he doesn't get doesn't get these cheap fouls. Um, now, that said, on the other end, um, he, some of those misses and some of those turnovers, the, he, he has every right to be upset that they didn't call fouls. I mean, they're they were manhandling him down there as well and they weren't calling fouls. So um, I, I worry about him as, in that sense where he does seem to get a little bit flustered, a little bit, um, uh, not a lot, but enough of, um, you know, uh, the ball getting knocked away or missing some shots uh, with a little bit of a bump that you would have to imagine would happen every single time down with no call in the NBA. Yeah, I mean, I don't think he's going to have to deal with foul trouble issues in the NBA because I don't think he's going to be playing 35 minutes, you know, ah, I, think, I think he'll be a situational player. I mean, I do think there's a chance he'll play more than let's say Boban, but I don't think he's a guy that you play 38 minutes either. Right. And remember Boban had really great hands, really nice touch. Uh, Edie is much faster than Boban. Like yes, all of that. That, yes, that, yes. hundred percent. He's stiff, but he's, he's strong and he can move, uh, you know, in the straight line up and down pretty well. Um, so yeah, I, I, I agree. I think the situational thing could be really good when you get him in there and he can have an impact on the game for like a four minute stretch at a time and then do those a couple times a game. Um, you know, he does have nice touch and, and again, he is, let's see, this is his fourth year, right? I don't even, I've, I've lost track of Zach Eady, right? He's a senior, isn't he? Um, Zach Eady stats. Let's just look at that real quick. I believe so. Um, so this is not someone who's going to be, you know, yeah, this is his fourth year. So. You know, he is um, he's he's getting to be closer to fully formed here. Right. Um, and it would be interesting to see just how much success a very, very traditional big center can have uh, in today's game without the ability. Now, is it possible he's going to suddenly start picking and popping and hitting some threes? I don't I don't know. I mean, if I really quickly. What's, check this. Let, let's look at the free throw percentage. Uh, his free throw percentage was 71% this year, 70% yeah. last year. And he's, he took two threes uh, and he made one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that's something that would definitely help his cause. If yeah. he could become a guy who spaces out. Especially because think about that. When you play a role like him, all you're doing is getting banged and banged down from one block to the next block. It's got to be really boring. So it would be just nice to break that up a little bit, get a catch on the wing, yeah. dribble handoffs, do some things like that. I'm not sure. I'm trying to picture in my mind's eye, even like dribble handoffs. I don't feel like they do much of that either. It's really just pick and roll, roll him to the basket, throw it up to him and a lob or a post up. And let him work. And what? Let him work. And let him work, yeah. Which yeah. is, again, at the college level, they don't have anybody. They haven't played anybody anywhere near his his height. So it's just like he's got five, six, seven inches on anybody who's guarding, or who's guarding him. It's crazy. The Drew Show is back. And, oh, my goodness, for even more of a uh, of a generous uh, super chat. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, LOL, I'll wait. Same terrible coaching will happen until Pop is gone. Combo has the right take. What incentive does Pop have to win or be the guy he was in 2000, 2009? Your, do your dogmatic view of Pop is sad. I guess he's talking about me, and I, I guess he's talking about me having a dogmatic view of Pop being a great coach. Is that what he's trying to say? I have no idea. Because well, he, I, well, like, well, as, as, the Drew Show could send us a regular comment to ask um, – uh, to further elaborate on, uh, I mean, well, he says that you the last, a, yeah, the last, I understand, I understand everything from the first two sentences, but the last sentence is a little, I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Right. Because like, I'm actually the guy who, who's been whispering for several years now about pop, uh, you know, maybe not being one of the greatest coaches of all time. Um, you know, little things I've been seeing since, since the, uh, the Manu era that, that, you know, I make me wonder about some certain stuff, um, about his coaching. So, you know, I'm kind of, you know, waffling a little bit in that, which is kind of heresy in the coaching, you know, ranks, right? We pop is supposed to be, you know, up there and he is, he, his, his results speak for themselves, but 
Um, I, it does make me wonder. And by the way, it doesn't make me wonder the same way as like for Phil. Um, you know, even though Phil inherited or you know took on took the over the team that had Scotty and Michael. Um, you know, I think it's pretty clear, and I think that Phil even even more so did it with the Lakers, where they had Shaq and Kobe for several years, and they really couldn't get past um, the, the the ceiling that they'd already established for themselves under Del, Del Harris and that stuff. And I thought that that um, it was masterful of that what Phil did in the, the Lakers, which kind of cemented his um, his his greatness. Pop, you know. Um, I don't know. I, I, there's some something happening here now. The incentive that Pop has to win is he doesn't want to ruin his "quote unquote" legacy. I would imagine, right? If he has, if his last five years are what we've had, I mean, that's that's unfortunate that we're doing it on purpose to get better draft picks. You know what I mean? That would, I don't think Pop would want to deal with that. Yeah. What was so impressive about Pop through the years is that, like, it was a dynasty, but it was like a stretched out dynasty. Like the teams were always good, and then every few years he won a championship. You know. That was what was impressive about his dynasty. Like it lasted a long time and it even ran through other dynasties. So, yeah, no, yeah. you're right. I mean, listen, the, the, the results speak for themselves. I, I just, I sometimes I'm watching some things and it's, I don't know, you know, I mean, I, I the first thing that comes to mind is like, he won't follow one up by three, which is just a real old school, like, you know, uh, it's like a stubborn approach to that. And it's hurt them so many times. Oh. Years. <laughs> oh, you know what I wanted to talk to you about? I mean, there's been two JJ uh, LeBron episodes since you've been out and, uh, yeah. and uh, LeBron is not a big fan of the two for one in some ways, you know, there is evidence, uh, you know, that, that it isn't as worth as much, you know, I think, um, Seth Partnow had said, it's really like one and a half for one, you know, because, yeah, that's, that's that's Seth, for sure. that great. and I know like, I got into it with somebody about a little bit like that, uh, on Twitter, where when you were down and it's inside of, you know, 30 seconds, you, you got to get the best shot you can as quickly as you can. You don't run the clock down. And I, people still struggle with this when it's really just math. Um, but it's not quite the same. But yes, JJ and LeBron are coming out with some stuff. It's interesting. Have you watched them? Yes, I watched both episodes. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to do a video on one of them because LeBron basically comes out and sort of says, "I I just didn't listen to anything that Darvin Ham said and just did whatever I wanted to do on the defensive thing." Which well, that, no, no, that, that, that was that was one play, right? It wasn't. He didn't no, say he did the whole second half. No, I understand, but it wasn't like the whole time Darvin Ham was. It, it, if if you just let that statement you just said like be what it is you'd be like lebron never listens to darvin ham oh okay <laughs> i just wanted to clarify I, I i just wanted to clarify fair enough if but okay if if it's if he's willing to go public and say for the second half of the Clippers game? I forgot what it was. Maybe the Clippers game. I am the game plan was this, and I said, nah, we're not gonna do that anymore. And by the way, it, it, you could argue it works. I gotta go through all the footage to make sure that because they they were down big against I, I think it was the Clippers, and then they came back and won, right? Something changed in the second half that helped them win that. Um, and I and I it, it's possible, yes, it was LeBron. Um he said he was not going to switch off of Kawhi. I think that's what it was. And I found, you know, I, I did go through some of the clips and it looked that way to me. So, um, but but I, if he's willing to sort of in a public manner like that in season, throw out there that he torpedoed, you know, Darvin Ham's game plan, you have to imagine he probably does that more than once. It, you know, he's done it oh, more often. I mean, we all know LeBron has veto power. Yes. And, and by the way, he's done that before. Like when they called up, when uh, David Black called a play uh, at the end of the Bulls Cavs series in 2015, 20, whatever year that was, um, he overrode that one coming out of the huddle. It was like, because remember, he was going to be a decoy and he caught it in the corner and hits the three to, to beat, uh, to win the game, I think. And that changed the entire series. That was the Bulls team that had, I think, Derrick Rose and, and Jan, uh, Joaquin Noah. Uh, that would have beaten – they could have beaten the Cavs. They had him on the ropes. And uh, and LeBron's overriding of the coach ends up, again, being, you know, the, the smart move. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the David Blatt-LeBron situation was really a good one or an ideal one, and that's why it didn't last too long. Nope. Uh, that is a, that's an accurate statement. And I think that Darvin Ham, you know, certainly the Lakers fans want um, want him out of there, you know, before the All-Star break. Uh and it's probably worth going through a little bit more. I mean, you know, I've been watching some Lakers games with half of an eye towards that. Um, does he really deserve it or does he not really deserve it? Um, but if you want to factor in, like, there have been moments where LeBron has said, not as specifically as he did in JJ uh, in his thing with JJ, but where he's, he's basically intimated that, yes, like, they're kind of, you know, 
living parallel lives, you know, LeBron and what they're doing on the court and what Darvin Ham would like them to do is sometimes it doesn't always uh, match. So um, we'll see how that all plays out and, um, and, and how, whether, whether Ham gets to, uh, you know, another shot at it next year. I, I don't think he does. Do you? It depends on how this season ends this postseason. <laughs> You know, it's funny because it, it, it didn't feel great last year, and then all of a sudden they got all the way to the conference finals, right? And some someone's like, oh, Darvin Hemp's figured some things out, right? And then, you know, the issues that we saw last year for most of the year last year are are still there, and they are barely going to make the playoffs. A lot a lot of injuries, though, not to make excuses for them. I mean, Gabe Vincent, Gabe Vincent hasn't even been around like the whole season. Uh, they, a lot of players in and out the lineup. It's, yeah, that, that, is, that is true. Yeah. Um, you know. And uh, and then all of a sudden, if they get healthy, by the way, Gabe Vincent should really, really help them. He in the little I mean, he did he's... play. There was a lot of opportunities there. It looked like okay, they're going to be able to you know improve from last year. So uh, we shall see. But, I mean, if he, um, could look, if he could look like he did in the playoffs last year, yeah, he'll def he'll definitely help them. Well, not... yeah, but that's that's not going to happen because last year's playoffs they were they were just the Heat were decimated by injuries, so he had to start you know, and he had to, he had to do those things. Whereas he's you know not going to be able to do that kind of role with the Lakers, but if he could, but, but he gives them something they didn't really have a lot of that really steady presence on both sides of the floor. I be, I believe a universal, a universal law of basketball is if everybody's playing the right way, everybody will naturally fit into their right roles. And if that happens, Gabe Vincent could maybe earn that role. Eventually you never know. You never know. Well, we have another super chat from Braun, uh, best friend of the breakdown. Thank you so much, Braun. Great to see you. Where does Mark Daniel, Dan Ignolt, Dan Ignolt, excuse me, I think that's how you said, rank among coaches? This season, one, but not overall. Yeah, he's terrific. He really is terrific on, a lot, on every level, communication-wise, managing yeah. the games. Uh, he's gotten better uh, every year. So, um, yeah, I, I, he's got to be top five or six at this point, right? Yeah, I would say top five or six, and yeah. I would say he's – the coach of the year this season. Oh, yeah, I think so. I think easily. Let me look at the standings real quick. OKC right now is number one uh, by half game in front of the Nuggets, who all of a sudden, out of nowhere, right, have, have trying to take wrestle, wrestle control of the Western Conference. Um, and let's face it, no one's, no one's beating them. They're going to repeat. I agree. If they stay healthy, I agree they will repeat. Um, yeah. the, Mav the Mavs are actually looking scary right now, though. They are. So the Mavs have figured some things out. And also, like I said before we started recording, there is a nice thing about the NBA that you're never that far off from a stretch potentially of bad teams you get to play. And when you do that, uh, a lot of times things get uh, fixed really quickly, right? And they might not be the most indicative, you know, uh, way of looking at this. But let's look at they, they've won, uh, well, I want to say 12 of the last 13, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 of the last 12. Uh, let's right. look at the wins. Let's look at the last 12 games. So they went, they beat the Heat, they beat the Pistons, they beat the Bulls, they beat the Warriors. Uh, then they, uh, they lost to the Thunder. Okay. And, and, and uh, then uh, that was, see, that was in OKC on the road. But then they beat Denver at home. Uh, they beat the Spurs and eh, they beat the Jazz twice in a row. They beat the Kings twice in a row and they beat the Rockets. So it's a little up and down. It's a little bit harder to tell exactly what they figured out or not. Um, and I, I brought up some lineup stats that I wanted to see over the last uh, 12 games what their lineups look like here. And obviously, the, the starters, it's Kyrie, uh, Derek Jones Jr., uh, P.J. Washington, Doncic, and Gafford, uh, which is, you know, they, those are some of the newcomers yeah. they've been throwing together. That's the most played lineup they've had in those, in those 12 games, and it's a plus 23.1. Yeah, I mean, Luca and Kyrie figured it out. Like, they're playing great, and they're meshing well together. The biggest questions are – if as a team they're good enough defensively and if there's enough around Kyrie and Luka. And then Tim Hardaway Jr. is always going to be the X factor for that team. If he plays well, they'll win games and they'll win series. Which is exactly why he has to come off the bench. Like whenever they had him in too much of a big role, then you then that's when he's going to hurt you. So uh, when you can find the right role for him, he could be the athletic wing that could hit threes and put the ball on the ground and do those things. But when he thinks or he gets into a role where it's it's they're asking too much of him, he can't keep that up. But um, the, let me just say this. The defensive rating of that five 
is 94.2, which is completely elite, you know, as more elite than anybody. And remember, you got guys like Gafford and Washington and Derek Jones Jr. Those are those are good defensive players to elite defensive players, guys that can really shut them down. And then you throw, you know, Doncic and Irving, who are not defensive players, but when you have three of them around around you, then you can really do some damage with Gafford rolling in the rim and causing a lot of vertical um, uh, spacing yeah. uh, and gravity. Uh, you're now pulling some things out. I kind of want to look at Derek Jones Jr.'s uh, stats. He had a year where he did shoot from well from the three, but I feel like that's not that's not always been his uh, thing. Let me just see here. Maybe I'm let me make sure I'm not wide off here. But uh, let's see his yeah his career from three is 31.7 percent. This year he's at 35, and that's probably enough uh, to be 35 percent, 36. It's enough to have a half a half step toward him for spacing. Um, you know, and then they can continue to use the spacing they need with just Luca and um, and Kyrie shooting it. But there's another lineup out here in the last 12 games that does stand out in my mind. Hasn't played a ton, but the second most played lineup um, has a higher net rating. It's plus 32.9. It's only played in seven of the last 12 games and only played 28 minutes, but it's the second most played. It's uh, Tim Hardaway Jr., Dante Exum, Kleba, Doncic, and Lively. So you take Doncic and you surround him with four other you know players off the bench. That's huge, right? Because it lets uh, Kyrie get some rest. But when you can squeeze out that much from a pretty much almost all defense uh, bench lineup, um, that should be huge for the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, I don't think teams want to play them. I'll tell you that. Um, I think okay. teams. I, I think te- I think teams rather play the Kings. I think teams, as much as I love OKC. Like, I think the Lakers rather play OKC than the Mavericks. The Lakers play OKC than the Mavericks. Interesting. Yeah, probably. They probably would think, okay, these guys are still young. Yeah. We have a, a size and a strength uh, yeah. advantage there. Um, yeah. So, and then they don't necessarily have that. You know, I don't think that LeBron wants to deal with Gafford and he doesn't want to deal with Washington and, and those bigger forwards that could be really physical. So, uh, AD probably not either, right? I mean, the key to the Lakers was how he's having another big center like, um, uh, JaVale McGee or Dwight Howard. You want to have another anchor there that could be the physical guy that could back them up. Uh, they haven't had that. I, yeah, and I got fooled today, as I told you, Coach Nick, with the April Fools, Dwight Howard to the Warriors. They got me. I mean, I was like, by the way, I've been like barely uh, paying attention the past eight or nine or ten days as on vacation. Uh, a little, a, a little happening, but a, li- a little self-deprecation. See, I even admitted it on a live show. That means I'm growing. I would never even say that the year. Yeah. Before. Well, I mean, I'm glad I realized today was uh, April first. I was like, that's got to be what that was. I, but by the way, I don't know what timeline you've got going on, but I, I that hasn't even bubbled up on my timeline anyway. Oh yeah, the the, the, the worst the worst one I saw was the Caitlin Clark um, elbow injury that she's out for tonight. I'm like, oh, that's that's that's, that's not even cool. that, that injuries are not cool to fake to screw. Yeah, that, that that's not even funny. Yeah, um, let's see. I think we have some more super chats. Let's get to those real quick. Drew the Drew, Drew shows out a heater as we call him. Another uh, super chat. Thank you so much, Drew. Nobody's willing to view Pops five years and just say he is not the greatest coach of all time instead of maybe. Just say it already. Zach Eady is Brooke Lopez with no three-point shot, four inches, and 30 pounds. <laughs> uh, you know what? Brooke Lopez and Zach Eady is not a bad comp, except for the fact that Brooke has, you know, shoots threes. But then again, Brooke did not shoot threes in the beginning. So I like that comp, uh, actually. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I feel like Brooke used to be more post-up, but get into his mid-range bag, too, more than Zach Eady. Zach Eady's more post-up and then get all, all the way to the rim or hit you, like, off the shoulder with like a jump hook, but right. I, I could see, I, mean, I could, yeah. I could see what he's saying. I could see what he's saying. I mean, Brooke Lopez with the Nets used to be like they used to ISO Brooke Lopez, but you know, yeah, but in the post, like in the post, in the yeah, same yeah, kind yeah, of way, yeah. right? Like he didn't even get beyond, um, you know, um, you know, what am I saying? Uh, he, he didn't get beyond 10, 12 feet, uh, you know, even back then in the mid range stuff, he would just be mostly back to the basket. So, uh, at that age, so I like that comp uh, a lot. And if Edie could ever develop the three point shot. Uh, you know what? And by the way, his his free throw percentage isn't like amazing, but the the form looks fine, and he seems like he's got decent touch. He can shoot it with some arc. Um, so to me, it feels like okay, there might be a way for him to translate that into the next step of 18, 20, 24, get behind the line and start shooting those threes. So, but it won't that won't happen for a long time. I mean, you can't, I don't think you can just go from not shooting them all for four straight years in college to all of a sudden taking three or four a game. But uh that could be a, a yeah. trajectory for him. Um, it probably also depends on where he goes. 
Um, but uh, but let's see. But Drew wants to say nobody's willing to view Pops five years and just say he's not the greatest coach of all time. I, I, I'll say that I don't think he's the greatest coach. I would probably I'd still put Phil over Pop if I had to anyway. Yeah, interesting. I, I was um, thinking a little bit about your Zach Eady point, and even contrary to my point, like maybe the talent could defy the NBA fit, and some coach finds a way. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's not forget the best three point shots are off of offensive rebound kickouts. And when you have a player that can grab offensive rebounds and make those kickouts, that's good for you. Well, so, but, you but you do have to get back on defense if, you, if you're doing a lot of that. Uh, well, yes. Or you can yeah. mitigate that. Like, okay, you'll give up some of those, but you're going to be getting more threes on your end. Okay. So yeah. maybe it yeah. balances out a little bit. Um, you know, they're not going to score every time on a break, right? So Maybe uh, he could help the Warriors right now, right? If you just planted he, them there. Yeah, I mean, I think what the Warriors need, I mean, listen, Trace Jackson Davis has been fantastic for them, and he actually is a good passer. So to, in my mind, what you really would like from the Warriors, especially with their offense, is the passing stuff. Yeah. Um, did we even talk about Draymond getting thrown out? I think no, that we was, didn't. We didn't. We didn't. All right, we have to talk about that. Well, and, and by the way, Drew, uh, thank you. We, we love you, Drew, as thank always, uh, and love to give you as much hype as we can. And no, nothing personal at all. Um, I just think that um, – I, I, I think that you're mad that I'm not calling Pop out, but I kind of – I have a little bit uh, here and there. <laughs> so, but you're right. Sometimes in the coaching, uh, uh, you know, circles, it's a little bit, uh, you get a little bit nervous about doing that with someone like pop, but um, I, I will, I will spring that in a little bit. The notion that maybe um, either his legacy is being sullied for, for the last several years, or maybe, maybe the fact that he had those guys, uh, you know, uh, was, they were maybe a little bit more instrumental than he was in all that success. So that's all I'm saying. Um, but um, let's see here. Are we in any more super chats? I think we're getting close to the end. I, I got to get back to, you know, I've been gone for so long. I got to get some more videos done. People are probably wondering where the heck I've been and where the videos are. I'm still not quite sure what video I'm doing today. Uh, should I do one on, on Edie? Do it on Edie or do it on combo hitting a right-handed floater from the free throw line to win the game in the Equinox gym and everybody getting mad. And then I had to talk trash to everybody because that's what well, I. they do. were mad because it was a righty floater why you shouldn't nah, they were they were just mad because i was talking to them and then i won the game with the offhanded floater but this is just you know i know the masses don't care about that so you should probably go with uh zach ed well if you don't have the video then it doesn't it didn't happen oh yeah 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 it's on ig you could look at it oh it is oh, okay yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no no but go with zach ed because i think the masses would care more about zach ed so okay yeah, that's well, going. well by the way we were talking about maybe doing nc state and um and their big guy um Brand, brand, no, whatever his name is, whatever his name is. Anyway, um, and I, you know, did Duke even try and double him at all? I, I saw some of the highlights, and there was not one double anywhere near him, and they could not handle his his. Um, he looked just like Zach Randolph to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy's good. Jokic was complimenting him, right? Uh, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, but, I, mean yeah, I mean, real recognizes real. Like, if Jokic is saying that, I, I think it means something. For sure. And like yeah. and he was a clone of Randolph, a guy like they, they, you could not keep him outside the lane. And then he had a really nice touch when he would face up or do little hooks. He's um, strong, right? Strong guy. Yeah. And so like the Duke guys, these skinny Duke big men, you know, it was, it was kind of like, where's your lower body strength that you can't, they couldn't do anything to it. And, but at that point you need to double, uh, especially as it gets to a low scoring game and NC state gets an eight or nine point lead, like, you know, a two pointer in, you know, with it, it toward the second half ends up being a big shot. You got to be able to stop and rotate out of. So um, I don't know. I'm going to, I might go through the footage there, but Edie, I think certainly everyone seems to be really mad about him. And I'll just say this again. He should be the one mad. There were calls that he did not get that he should have gotten yesterday. He should have had more points, more free throws. Um, we talked about the three three second call stuff a little bit, where he you know he clears by getting the one foot off the ground, and the other foot out. Um, and I, and I, I I'll have to see it, but I don't think there's going to be many uh, potential possessions where he clearly fouled somebody and they didn't call it. You know, I think that's everyone's like. I think there's also that weird mindset. He, you know, they drove to the basket. He must have fouled. You know, if you drive 20 times, there's going to have to be five foul calls in that. And there doesn't. It could be zero. They could play perfect defense on all 20 of those drives, and there won't be any fouls. Show me the footage or shut your mouth, I guess, is how we have to say it. All right, so let's um, finish with uh, the Draymond ejection. Steph Curry cries. Yeah. Really Jay, Williams, Jay Williams questions Steph's leadership. He didn't question it, but he said – High level people, whatever that means, um, are talking about Steph Curry's leadership. Yeah, you know, I wish I could, you know, I, I, I don't know, man. I, I, I just, 
I, I just I just think it's a weird take. I, I think it's a weird take because yeah, Keeps I going. mean Steph Steph Curry cannot control what Draymond does. Steph Curry cannot control if Draymond wants to choke Rudy Gobert. He cannot control if he wants to kick somebody in the lower extremity. He cannot control if Draymond wants to get ejected. There's nothing Steph Curry could do to stop Draymond from acting the way Draymond acts. So I don't know what this has to do with Steph's leadership. Okay, I might not agree with you, but Steph's leadership, let me just say this, is, is definitely hands-off. He wants to lead by example. He is not somebody who's going to grab you by your jersey, get in your face, and and you know get you on the right path. It's just not his makeup. It's not his, per, his personality like we talked about before. Um, now I wrote, uh, to the, to the LA times, this is, uh, in, in February of 1999 and they printed my letter and I had framed it. Can you see this? That's cool. Let me, let me turn off the, uh, make it, uh, when no. are you going to print like a combo Jersey and put it up on your wall? Uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe you have to give me one. Can you okay. read that? Can you see what it says? Re readers won't let Lakers worm way out of this one. Okay, so you might remember when Rodman got to the Lakers, right, for a brief period in 1999. Maybe you forgot. Maybe you're too young. So he gets there, and this was after the three-peat that they did in, in the, um, with, the Lake, uh, with, the, with the Bulls. And I had lived through that three-peat with, with the Bulls. And remember, Rodman was a distraction. He was, you know, it, it was easily a distraction. However, because he had Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen uh, as teammates – like there was a moment when Rodman started to go at it with the rest and they literally tackled him to the floor. You could probably find it on YouTube pretty easily and ended up being a, like, they all ended up laughing and Rodman too, like as the absurdity of it all. Right. And so in this letter, I said, can you imagine Sh uh, Kobe or Shaq doing that with Rodman to try and calm him down or get in or whatever? And I, everyone agreed like, no, that, that this was the issue. This is before Phil joined. This is the, what they needed was Phil Jackson to lead that team. So the, the point of this is, is that you can have players who would be able to, to I don't want to say keep Draymond under control, but would step in and stop him. They would have stepped in and stopped him before he punched the crap out of um, Jordan Poole. But nobody on that team, and there's a leadership thing, you know, did that. You watch that footage of uh, Draymond Green punching Poole, right? Everyone is all you know, 5, 10, 12, 12 feet away, and they're all wandering around saying, please just be finished yelling at him so we don't have to deal with this anymore. Right. And then he punches him, right? Because nobody was nearby. I see so, what you're I see what you're saying. You're saying that if Steph Curry sees this bubbling up or somebody else sees this bubbling up, get them as far away from each other as possible. Step, yeah, you step in, you lead, you do that. Now, again, it's not his makeup, it's not his personality. So I don't you can't just expect him to be somebody he's not. And that's and that's a fact, and, uh, and and it's worked out pretty well for them, right? I mean, very, but, very, very well. Yeah, the dynasty. But, you know, even like when David West was on the team uh, with the Warriors, that was a guy who would have stepped up to Draymond, and it was tough, and would have been like, "Stop!" And he probably did. Bogut might have as well. They don't have that anymore, and that's the problem here with uh, with what's going on with Draymond. And so, um, and if they I mean, were third yeah. in the conference, okay, maybe it's okay, but they have no margin for error at this point, and they ha certainly can't handle this. You know, if, if Draymond starts up like that and gets a T or whatever in in a play-in game, that that could that could end their season right there. I see what you're saying, Coach Dick, but Draymond has to be held accountable for Draymond. I don't think that all the way comes down to Steph Curry's leadership. Steph Curry just happens to be the best player on that championship team. And if Draymond's going to keep doing Draymond things, I don't think Steph Curry is the one who should be blamed. Uh, no, you don't blame you don't blame him. Um, you just wish that he had somebody else with a, a different personality to counteract that and keep uh you know uh what's uh draymond focused now you might not remember but dennis robin had a guy jack haley who was one of his best friends who they kept on the team to sort of he was a big cheerleader and he was a you know fun guy to be around and actually not a bad player he didn't get a lot of opportunities for the bulls but he also was sort of like the whisperer for rodman and, and did that role as well to try and keep him a little bit more uh of a, of a you know his demeanor smooth um, and that's what they, they just simply don't have that right now. And um, it, again, it, it wouldn't matter if if the season was going a lot better than it is. But because it's everything is so razor thin, they can't afford it. Are, are they going to hang on? Like, let me ask you this. Let's get the standings right now. They um, they are hanging on and they actually won that game where Dre yeah. got ejected and Steph started crying. Right. And they have a two and they have a two game lead on Houston with how many games? 74, uh, eight games left. 
So that's almost insurmountable. It's, it would be really hard to lose a two-game lead with eight games remaining. Uh, it can happen, but it's, it seems pretty good that they're going to be uh, where they are. And that also means, real quickly as we wrap this up, uh, they, I, they're locked into 10th, it looks like, and they're going to have to play the Lakers, I think, right, in the play-in, right? Isn't that how that works? Um, let me make sure. Am I forgetting every year? I forgot the plan. Uh, seven and eight play and nine and ten play, right? Um, my goodness gracious, play in tournament. Um, uh, please remind me. Oh, here it is. Yeah, so seven and eight play and nine and ten play, and then the winner of nine and ten has to play the loser of seven and eight. So basically, what happens is um, they'll, they'll they'll probably play the Lakers. Now, are the Lakers going to move up? Uh, they're only they're the game and a half behind the Suns. Again, game and a half is tough with eight games left. So that, let's just say that that's locked in. Although the Kings and the Suns are tied with it uh, in that in that seventh eighth spot, so that could flip, um, which changes some things for that next round. But can the Warriors beat the Lakers in a one game series? Oh, I lose you. We don't hear you now. What happened? That's the question, and we can leave it up to people in the in the comments to figure out. Uh, Oh my goodness! What's going on with mics? With the mic, the combos, mic, switch mics. I don't know. Let's finish it up, or uh, I guess I'll finish it up. But um, the Lakers now. Uh, but to answer that question, I think the Warriors could beat the Lakers for sure uh, in a one-game series, and obviously the other way happens too. So that'll be really fascinating. And then you got to figure out who's going to win between the Suns and the Kings. Um, you know, you I, do you have to go with the Suns? Can you hear me? Can you yes, hear me? Nice, right, you're back. Go. Okay. So you have to deal with the Suns and the Kings. Who who wins the Suns Kings uh, play in game? Oh, that's a tough one. It is. It is. You know. I think. I think. I think I'm going. I think I'm going Kings. Yeah, the Suns are just kind of a. It's a. It's a malformed team. I think. Right. It just. It just doesn't quite all work together well. Uh, they had something back before they 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 broke it up uh, with Aiden. And I, I just I, I wish one day maybe the book will come out and explain what happened there between Monty Williams and, and, and DeAndre Aiden and why that couldn't be repaired. Um, so, OK, so the Kings win. That means the Suns are going to play the winner of the Lakers uh, Warriors. Um, you know, again, we'll, we'll have some star power at the very bottom of the Western Conference playoffs, which is interesting. Um, and then it's all moot because whoever gets out of that loses to the Nuggets. Yeah. If they stay healthy, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I think they win it all. Yeah. All right. Well, so that's that's our little preview for the Western Conference. But we'll have to get some more clarity in the next, like, week uh, when we get down to, like, five games left. So awesome stuff. Great show, Combo. Great to be back here. I, I hope uh, – well, my batteries are recharged. Hope you can find some uh, some recharging on your own. I will. Shouts to D Don DeMarco for the T-shirt. I appreciate you. Thank you. All right, Don. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> else out there uh, for being part of this huge show we had today and all the super chatters, uh, certainly Drew show. Uh, thank you again for being so generous on all those. And um, we'll be back again next week, won't we? Yes, sir. We usually go Monday, so be on the lookout. For sure. And uh, don't forget, sports fans at B-Ball Breakdown. We're not a channel. We're a conversation. You in? Are you in, Combo? Yes, sir.